Hello everyone, my name is Jason Hanley, VP of Education and Visitor Engagement here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum in Cleveland. It's been a busy week here. We just announced our 2021 class of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees and what an amazing class it is. We can't wait for the induction ceremony to happen this fall in Cleveland. What's love got to do, got to do with it? And it's too late, baby. Yeah, they got to be. Some good girls going bad, the city's filled with them. One by one, hitting up my sleeve. Hello, it's me. The revolution will be no rerun, brothers. The revolution will be live. Thank you for joining us for the Land of Hope and Dreams, a celebration of Dave Marsh's work and vision. This event has been a year and a half in the making, and while music journalism is at the center of that story, the organizers built the conference so that it held true to Dave's never-ending quest to build bridges between the worlds of music, politics, healthcare, and social justice. Thank you to the steering committee members for putting together such a great program, and for asking the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to be involved in the presentation of tonight's spotlight conversation between author Daniel Wolf and the man himself, Dave Marsh. While this is the last weekend of the conference, there's still a number of exciting events you can catch, including a great panel tomorrow about music and education, featuring some good friends of the museum, Holly Gleason and Craig Werner, among others. And if you want to go back and see all the great events that have already taken place, they all are all available to you on YouTube. These panels are offered for free, but we ask that you consider making a donation to the Kristen Ann Carr Fund, which Dave Marsh and Barbara Carr started in honor of their late daughter nearly 30 years ago. The foundation raises money for sarcoma research and fellows, and you can find a link to it on the Land of Hope and Dreams website. And now, I'd like to introduce the Rock Hall's president and CEO, Greg Harris, with a short message to Dave. Hello, Dave. It's fitting that I'm standing inside the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio. In fact, I'm inside the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame gallery where all of the inductees have a plaque. You had a hand in selecting so many of these classes as a stalwart member of the nominating committee for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You've had a great relationship with our museum. You've come out for our special music masters programs. You've written bios, you've edited things, and you've just been an all around great friend of the museum. We're so grateful for everything you've done and just wanted to take a moment and say thank you both for the museum work but also for the impact on so many readers, so many fans from Cream Magazine to Rolling Stone to The Village Voice. You've been the voice of rock and roll. You've shared your thoughts, you've shared your analysis and you've impacted all of us in the way we listen, the way we understand, the way we appreciate. So Dave, on behalf of everybody out here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I think on behalf of all these plaques that are hanging here, all the artists that are honored and recognized, we want to say thank you and good wishes. Thanks, Greg. As Greg mentioned, Dave has been a part of our museum over the years, including the keynote lecture for our Smokey Robinson Music Masters event back in 2015, but he's also been a friend and a guiding light to many of us. In fact, Lauren Anke, myself, and the education team here all went back and reread his great The Heart of Rock and Soul when we first started our online educational classroom, which is now turned into the robust, free Rock Hall EDU platform, serving nearly one million students around the world. And I have to say, too, to share a personal story, when I had a chance to interview the great Tommy James a number of years ago, I was able to give Dave a call and get some advice from him about a really good way to interview Tommy, someone who he had interviewed himself before. I'll never forget that. It's something that helped make me a better person and a better interviewer. And to get to talk to Dave Marsh before you're working around the history of rock and roll was a real special moment for me uh, as an educator, a scholar, and an interviewer. 
Now, let's hear the wonderful singer, songwriter, and Americana artist, Patty Griffin, who shares the things she loves about Dave Marsh. I met Dave Marsh, I'm pretty sure I met Dave Marsh in the late 90s uh, with an ex-boyfriend of mine who was also a musician. And right off the bat, he invited us, when we were passing through New York, he invited us to um, come with him to see Springsteen play one of his many nights that summer he was playing at the Meadowlands in New Jersey and we sort of took a ride with him from Manhattan over to New Jersey and he very generously, uh, Springsteen very generously allowed us to sit in on the sound check and, um, and then we uh, saw the show which was three hours long and of course not long enough and then, um, and it was just thrilling and, and I believe that um, I sat next to to Dave that night and I believe that in the concert he cried at some point so I mean one of the one of the striking things about him right off the bat was the emotional involvement with music and um, which seemed exactly right to me for someone who's spent his life you know writing about it and telling people about it you know it's like you, you I, I think that sometimes writing about music can be very tricky business because people drift off into aficionado land and, and they develop tastes and actual snobbery around things. And I don't get that vibe from, from Dave ever. I never have. And it's, you know, and it, and it also having been able, been um, lucky enough to be interviewed by him maybe once or twice, um, it, it allows you to drop your guard a little bit and really talk about music from the place that is a little more honest, you know, uh, when you're, it, it's hard for musicians to talk about music and making music. And um, I think just sitting across from a fan and also being a fan, you get to, uh, it gets you excited about it. And so it, it's fun to sit down and have a conversation with him about music. So I imagine that is part of the success he's had as a music writer, is that he's such a fan and um, musicians are too. So it's fun to talk to him. Another thing that I bonded with him over was uh, his love of James Baldwin. James Baldwin to me was the, the writer that turned the light bulb on for writing for me. You know, I've been writing songs and writing songs and uh, I read The Fire Next Time sometime in my late 20s and, and discovered this way to think about r what to write and, and, and what, you know, where you would have to go inside yourself to sort of get to that. And, and, and Dave, is and it is knows a lot about James Baldwin. He actually gave me James Baldwin's children's book as a gift uh, years ago, and uh, like a, a a copy from back in the day when they were. I think they reprinted them, but they were hard to get back then. And I still, you know, treasure it. And um, um, let me see, what else do I? love about Dave. I guess, you know, one of the things that I would say about Dave um, that I've gotten to talk to three writers who sort of come from his era of people who write about music. And uh, it, it's thrilling because they have encyclopedic knowledge of so much music that I'm interested in and and I've learned things that I didn't know from all of these people. And I grew up in Maine. I grew up in kind of rural Maine, definitely small town Maine. And, uh, you know, access to, I had a very strong hunger for new music, you know, in my teen years, I would say. And the access to it was pretty limited there. It was based on the, the tastes of the local DJs, which was, pretty good and there was a lot to choose from but you know your mind wants more so I used to 
you know, catch a bus to the mall and go through the Rolling Stone magazine and, and try to find, you know, read it and not get thrown out for not buying it and, um, and discover new music through the writers there. And I'm certain that I discovered music, music through Dave's writing there. So to actually get to meet Dave and and have a conversation with him even once about music would be thrilling. But I've gotten to do see him and hang out with him more than once, and uh, uh, he's 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 invested in it. His heart is in it, and it's. Uh, it's just feel really lucky. Thanks, Patty. I love hearing about the time you saw Springsteen's show with Dave and the, witnessed his emotion. It really demonstrates the power of music and rock and roll. The real reason we all perform it, listen to it, write about it, share it, and for many of us, talk about it day and night. And I can think of no better way to transition into our main event for this evening. Tonight's interviewer is Daniel Wolf, someone I've had the pleasure of working with before at the museum particularly when he came to speak about his wonderful book, The Fight for Home, How Parts of New Orleans Came Back, as well as his writing on Rock Hall inductees Sam Cooke, Bob Dylan, Woody Guthrie, and Bruce Springsteen. As the subject of this conference and event, it would seem that Dave Marsh needs no introduction, but I can't resist just giving a few points from his career. He was co-founder and editor of Cream Magazine, an associate and contributing editor to Rolling Stone, writing cover stories on Bruce Springsteen, Patti Smith, The Rolling Stones, and The Who. His journalism and criticism has appeared in numerous other publications, and he's authored 25 books, including two bestsellers about Springsteen. For more than 15 years, he's hosted Kick Out the Jams and other programs on Sirius XM. This premiere of the conversation between Daniel and Dave uh, that happened last week is happening here tonight. But as you're watching, feel free to leave questions for Dave and Daniel in the chat, and they'll work to answer them at a later date on the Land of Hope and Dreams website. So here we go. Let's turn it over to Daniel Wolf and Dave Marsh. But I think I got it now. <laughs> oh, took me a long time to find it out. But I think I got it now. Oh, yes, I did. I found out a long time ago. Dave and I are going to talk about a... Not quite random selection of songs, but a panoply, a panoply, thank you, David, of songs. Um, and get his reaction. Panoply? I don't care. Fair enough. That's why we're friends. There you go. Let's start at the start. One Monkey Don't Stop No Show. I put that first because you and I had been talking about it a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's really about Joe Tex. Because mm -hmm. a bunch of people do that song. He was so close to being a comedian. At the same time, he was a love man. At the same time, he was a kick-ass, you know, heartbreak singer. Mm -hmm. And I was dying to interview him for Cream Magazine. I couldn't have been more than 20 years old. 21, maybe, not 20. And so we're at the 20 Grand, we're at the 20 Grand Club. The 20 Grand Club was kind of the most important uh, black nightclub in Detroit, mm -hmm. at least that I knew of. And he was playing there. When you went, I mean, well, he was he was gonna be playing there, mm -hmm. and so I said, I don't know what I did. He must have had a record out, goodness knows what label. And I and I wangled an interview with Joe Tex. Now, what I knew about Joe Tex was his records. Period. End of story. I'm not the timid little person I appear to be. <laughs> Put me in front of a microphone and I warm up fast. Put me next to a celebrity that I care a lot for, a music, particularly a musical one, and I'll find a way through. Doesn't always make them happy because I can start out pretty clumsy. But once I've found a, 
once I floundered around a little bit. Anyway, so this day we walk into this uh, the 20 Grand Club. It was a motel in front and a nightclub in the back. And so I go into the motel part and there's this Joe Tex and a friend of his whose name I never did learn. And they are throwing punches. <laughs> and they're talking about some fight that was just on, I don't know, TV or maybe they were at it. I don't know. So I'm standing there like a white boy with his jaw flapped open. And they're talking about this fight in great detail. I don't know that I've ever heard, including on TV, a fight described, discussed in such great detail. And finally, they turn around to me like, okay, only honky in the house, what are you here for? And I said, well, Joe, I probably said, well, Mr. Tex, because I'm still a little boy for one, and number two, it was Joe Tex. So I said, you know, I wanted to ask him some questions about the songs and his singing them and really his whole career and Joe was not flabbergasted. I guess some people had tried that before. But I think it maybe amused him a little bit. And it maybe surprised him a little bit that I did know a few things, but I stress a few. So we get to talking, and I asked him a sort of filler question, the kind of question you ask of somebody that you're not sure what to ask next. How did you find out that it had crossed over to, you know, like pop mm -hmm. radio or rock radio, or whatever they called it? And he said, well, he says, you know, in those days, all the stations were divided. The, 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 the black music was all way down here on the left, you know. Mm -hmm. Lower numbers. This is AM dial. Yeah, but it's only AM dial. Right. We, even I wasn't thinking in terms of FM at that point. And he he said, uh, and they were driving back from I don't know LA or something through Texas. And one of the guys says to Joe, "You know, it's so weird because I'm picking this, I'm picking the song up." On these on these white channels, <laughs> these white white stations. So Joe says, "Hmm." <laughs> I guess he called the 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 record company, and he's telling me this story, and they're still throwing punches <laughs> and talking about the fight. And it was just one of the most revealing things. And they, I mean, they were great, and their hospitality was great. I, I mean it the exact opposite of the way it might sound, because they put me in their circle. It's great. And, you know, Joe, Joe was, he was funny. He did these heartbreak songs. He was just kind of a person you were not going to meet walking down the street, in particular my street. You know, my street was not... Well, you might run into them, but they'd be running. Um, <laughs> the sad truth. Uh, so we just, and then we sat and we talked for about, I don't know, half an hour maybe. Yeah. And I don't know that I even managed to get the story into cream. And maybe I did do a short story, but, but the thing was that the hospitality I received, introducing these people in their, in their leisure time, did not stop them, and, and dealing with a known, by now, a known ignoramus. Not quite, but pretty close. And I'm getting this whole, and I'm getting, getting a whole history, I'm getting a, a history of like uh, R&B plus boxing. <laughs> <laughs> they're just going on like, they're doing exactly what I want them to do. They're going on like I'm not there, and every once in a while I'll stick in a, another dumb question. And it was great, because it was really like 
you know, you want to compare it to, to trying to interview Charlie Watts? Right, you know? right. <laughs> so then I went and I started looking deeper. And Joe made a lot of records. And what I learned in the course of this, and this is pretty much how my career has gone, it's how my life has gone around that kind of music which I, in which I am always an interloper, came out of it was so much more than I dreamed existed. It isn't like, oh, I learned a lot more about... No, this is like, oh, I learned about this other planet, too. <laughs> and, and I learned a lot about Joe Tex. And he was just, you know, and, and I think he might have been... He was definitely in... This was like very, very early 1970s. So I don't know if he... If I, or if I thought he belonged to the Nation of Islam or what. But he wouldn't have any trouble with a white boy because he was white, that's for sure. And you know, that knocks down a lot of walls. And he could knock you down with, I mean, play a record, but Joe Tex separates the man. Joe Tex separates the men from the boys. That's still true. And he... Uh, He's not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I'm still angry about. If, to me, he will always be a noble gentleman. And uh, I guess it's a good place to start because it's something I'm very grateful about on top of having had a blast. <laughs> Patty Griffin, which is nice because that's my next song. Heavenly Day, Patty Griffin, who you wrote a long piece on for the Austin Chronicle, is that right? Yes. Well, I don't know where, I don't remember where I first heard Patty. I mean, certainly on a record. And I don't remember who played it for me. Mike could have been uh, Tom Jerk. Mm hmm because he was the big Patty fan at that moment that I knew. And he played me that first album. And I was, and this is something, I can't tell you this about very many things because it never happens, almost. I was speechless. I was speechless about her voice. I was speechless about her songwriting. She had, something that I hadn't heard, if I'd ever heard it before, in a long, long time. And uh, so when I got a chance, I would go see her, and then at South by Southwest that year, whatever year it was, I got to meet her, and uh, I don't know if she liked me, but she liked how enthusiastic I was. <laughs> <laughs> but I liked her, too. And she's, because she's so smart, and she's not afraid of her own passion. And you know, that's a thing. Performers less than others, but pretty much everybody's afraid of their own head up moments. And I don't know what Patty's from, but I have never struck it. And we eventually had a number of conversations. She's a, she's a James Baldwin. Fan, right? Well, that was another uniter for her and I to become friends because uh, not only was is she, and I'm sure she still is, a James Baldwin fan, fan, she's as pissed off about raising America as I am. And that's still rare amongst white people, even white performers. And she was just there, and she wasn't trying to be anything that she wasn't. But she was totally committed to that being something that needed to change. And be not only needed to be changed, needed to be rectified. 
And, you know, people talk about changing the world like it's this big, big machine. I always tell young people, you want to change the world, make a baby smile. Because that's what my mom taught. That's what my mom taught me. And my mother was as racist as everybody else in the town I grew up in. <laughs> that's what I grew up with. That's why I'm a rebel. That's why I'm here. That is, from a certain point of view in my own head, that is what put me on earth. I don't mean that in a religious way. I don't mean that in a scientific way. I just mean it. And, you know, of course, that's walking a minefield, not because anybody wants to blow you up, but because it is so much that we don't know about each other, and particularly that white people don't know about black people. And uh, what music brought us to this corner? Well, this Patty Griffin in, in, in Heavenly Day. Oh, Bay. yeah. And Patty, but Patty was the first time, person I had met in a long time who had that same spirit that I did. No, I don't know what I'm doing here. All I know is I belong here and my mission here is not to change these other people, it's to change the people my people, mm -hmm. the people who think and who others think I'm part of. And Patty totally gets that, that the job is on us. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of people that I should be thanking here for teaching me that, starting with my great friend Frank Joyce, without whom I, many, many things would be different in my life. But that's probably the most important one. The work he did with young people and old, well, young people, because that's where I fit it in, on issues of race, yeah. color, whatever, you know, it's all one thing. And, you know, and then I suppose then if I'm going to mention Frank, I should mention John Sinclair because. It's another one of those things where you can think what you want to think. To me, one of the things, in addition to marijuana freedom or something, that the MC5 were about was ending racism. Mm -hmm. And they all believed it. But John was sort of the articulator of it. You know, Rob Tyner was a theoretician. But uh, John, you know, that was a big, big part. And that all came out of his, you know, relationship to beatnik poetry and all that stuff. So John was like an encyclopedia. Frank Joyce was like a Bible. <laughs> By which I mean both longer and deeper and detailed. And they were both righteous, and they still are. So, when I put together this list of songs, it, I looked at it and I thought, it, you know, this is gonna, this is all over the map because your taste and appreciation is all over the map. But I was sure you were going to tie them all together, which is clearly already happening. <laughs> so, so you won't have any trouble going to Jump by Van Halen. <laughs> I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> I remember talking about Jump because it well, came out when we were working on Rock and Roll Contest. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, what I remember about Jump is I, I got it, you know, a big LP, and I got it in the mail, and I opened it up, and I heard things about it, you know, about, about the band particularly. And I wasn't, you know, because that was sort of nominally a metal band, I guess. Yeah. And while I helped... In fact, I didn't have any help. While I coined the term heavy metal music, 
the no, I did help help. I shouldn't have said that. If I made a name for myself initially in music writing, beyond being the partisan of the MC5, and in particular, more than anybody, I was the champion of the students in the press. Because I was the one who understood that there was something more than noise. And it seemed like at the time, in that area, I was the only one who got it about about Iggy and how great he really is. And in fact, I have to confess that as great as I thought he was, how great he is now is even more of a mind blower. And that that was that was how much was going on in Detroit back then. Yeah. I can remember, and, and it's and it's still important. If I were writing my tombstone, I'd write about him and say, this is the first guy to get it. Because that's how I, I just got it. You know, I mean, everybody, including Lester Banks, was looking at me like, well, this is a pile of noise, which it was. But it was noise with a function. It was noise with a purpose. And did I think it was beautiful? No, it wasn't supposed to be beautiful. All art isn't supposed to be beautiful. It wasn't ugly. It was powerful. And it was meant to change the fucking world. And you know what? A lot of help from Cream Magazine, which means me, among others. It did change the world. There's no punk without Iggy. There's no, there's none of that kind of music. Heavy metal would have been just a kind of stodgy thing without it. Because it was punk that came in and kicked it in the balls and said, lighten up. But not lighten up on the, what you're trying to say, lighten up on what you're doing. Make the song broader. Make the song, you know, more powerful by being broader. And don't be afraid. You don't have to be just yelling at people. You need to be open to people. And I know people don't hear that in the Stooges, and it's really a pity because that means they're missing half of it. And that's a lot because they're only thinking about Aki. They're not thinking about, in particular, I'm trying to remember what it's, you know, uh, what's this? This band makes me? Yeah, the band, but particularly the drummer. Yeah. Rock action. Uh -huh. The drummer. And, and, and you know, you listen to those early records now, they define the kind of drumming that still is being played. Well, and jump, for example, doesn't happen, right? Van no, the... none of that stuff happens without it. That's, that's right. That's, so when you go back to, to, to Van Halen on this, they're taking it even to my mind, in the texture of the music, or the, it's a change of into raw power again, but a new kind of raw, raw power because it's got newer kind of instruments, and it's a different kind of people a little bit, and they're not outlawed. They're understood to be doing, well, whatever the hell people think heavy metal is, I'm not gonna say it's an art form because number one, most people aren't that smart. And number two, it, it's not understood that way. But that's what it is to this day. But when I heard Jump, I remember Barbara came home that night. She was already working for her, John Landau and Bruce. I said, you want to hear a record you're going to hear for the rest of your life? I don't know what she expected, but <laughs> jump is what she got. Yeah. <laughs> and I still hear it. I can still hear it without putting it on the the, uh, the record player or whatever device is handy, which is the real test. But I, I think that there are probably literally millions of people who could say that about jump. Whoa.
This next song I'm going to ask you about, I hope feeds into this, there's a stereotype about who listens to heavy metal and what it is. The next song I want to ask you about is Please, Please, Please by James Brown. There's a stereotype about who listens to that, but I'd like to hear you. Well, that's our principle. We can stereotype anything. <laughs> you can take something as different. You know, I mean, li listen, this is the country we live in. Look at that hand. You see it? Is that white? It ain't white, it's pink. Do you know how long I had to fight with myself to learn that? And I still, I, I say it to people. When it starts getting a little dicey about, about race things, I go, that, 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 that is not white. <laughs> please, please, please was, was, you know, I don't know why it was that one, and it didn't have to be that one of all of the massive catalog of things that he's accomplished. But that's what it was for me. And I think it was just his complete passion. You know, you take all the rock, you even take Iggy and put him in a line, James will surpass them on that song. And on some others too, but on that song, it's just a crusher. I, it's, it's not his best record, necessarily, but it is the heart of the storm. And, and it's got a message, like everything else I like. I don't think about that too much because its message is not even secondary, I'm not even sure it's tertiary. But it's there. And what would you say it was? Please, please, please! <laughs> <laughs> what the hell else could it be? It doesn't say hardly anything else. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it's a weird song for me because it's a man asking something as if he were asking permission. Pleading for. Right. And at the same time, it's such a kind of... Well, he's fairly accomplished at seducing women, so therefore he's fairly accomplished that he is going to be rewarded. Nevertheless, he must maintain the manner, the, 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 what would you call it, the, uh, the manners of the hour. Mm -hmm. Got to do the right thing the right way. For many reasons, including the fact that she can turn on her heel and go home and say to hell with him. Over the extent of the song, to me, he seduces her and then seduces her and then seduces her. You know, he gets his answer, from me anyway. Well, you didn't think there was just one of them. <laughs> there you go. You never saw a James Brown show? <laughs> there was not just one more. <laughs> I don't think that ever happened. Right. Yeah, I am sitting here right now, by the way. I am sitting here trying to remember if James is still alive. Because in my head, somewhere way back in my brain, I know he's not. But in my head, James Brown might have died. There's a few of them like that, but not very many. Because he's important on records that if you line them up against the other records that I love, they're very almost skeletal. They don't have much melody. Right. They don't have any harmony. Because that would involve interrupting James. But what they have in buckets is passion. If you're not fully committed to passion in its highest expression, I pity your family. I pity your loved ones. I really do. Because either you're holding them back or you're too fucking stupid to figure things out. And, and that's just how it is what it is. And some little white boy comes up to your door and knocks. It's like me and Joe Tex all over again. It's like, I'm not here to explain this. I'm here to celebrate this. I'm here to, to learn this. Because it's not on every street corner. And that is 
the saddest truth that I know. Lost that loving feeling, the righteous brothers. Well, not a what, not I a white have, equivalent. I have percentage said you up to date. Uh, <laughs> that record came out in '65, so I'm 15 just. Well, I found this radio. It was about this big, along, you know, mm -hmm. wide, and it was about this high, and it was broken. It was. The, the 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 casing of it was cracked, and so if you played it very loud, you get a buzz. I don't mean like a buzz in your, you know, like from reefer or something. I just mean you you you'd hear a buzz, right? Bzz, 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 you know, but it didn't matter about that because I didn't have any radio before that. I had what was in the car and what was in on on you know the the kitchen table. And I took it home, and it was glory days. It was the glory. Because now I can... And, and all you had in, at that period of time, you know, I had CKLW and maybe two other radio sh stations to listen to that were playing rock records. And them, not all the time, and there were lots of commercials and blah, blah, blah. And I owned very few records because I had very few monies. <laughs> didn't make any difference. Changed my life. Changed my life on the spot. It must have buzzed when the when that song came on. You've lost that love and feeling. That's a mammoth song for a little radio. It wasn't a little radio. I mean, it was like yay by yay. In those days, that was a pretty good sized radio. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and it was... And love and feeling is the first thing I remember hearing from. I think I like, put it on went back, I, was, I had it in my bedroom, and I put it on and I went like to the hallway or something. And I came back, and it was still on, because that's a long record. By those, you know, and it's, and it's a long record. I mean, that's a five minute record, close to. And there were no, I mean, four minute record was outrageous. And not only is it still on, but it's still changing. <laughs> it's still, you know, this is a, another verse, another chorus. You know, and then he does that thing at the end. Go on, gone, gone, gone. Gone, 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 gone. That seems to take quite a long period of time. And... I mean, if, if I suppose if I'd been a Christian, I would have felt invaded, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, I felt inspired. And new. And that record wasn't, I mean, the music on it, there wasn't anything particularly new about it. it wasn't anything somebody had none it was it was its length and the pressure it created and and the way those guys sang yeah so that was the thing when i got involved with rock criticism that was a big thing a lot of the people were musicians and that was good they were writing about music and a few of them were writing about singers but not very many and so you got like San Francisco rock, where it was like you need some serious, serious uh, uh, equipment to find the passion in that, in the voices. You know, but if you're that stone, of course, that's the explanation, which is why I wasn't. Um, and I couldn't afford too much of that either. Uh, but then it very quickly became something that didn't work for me. Too much paranoia. You know, the person I have to pay great credit here to in my own life is John Landau. Because John Landau was the first person I knew, this is when he was working with the MC5, 
who, it seemed to me, understood and talked about the vocal part of the song as its key. I don't mean the words mm -hmm. exactly. I mean the utterances from the person's voice. Not that it was the only thing, of course it wasn't the only thing, and not that it had to be the central thing, it just kind of a lot of the time was, and he, he could go to that heart of the song, which almost nobody else did. You know, they get all hung up in George Harrison's guitar line, which, okay, it was a great guitar line, guitar line but we move on. Um, and I was probably, you know, because I tried to play, but I was terrible. Um, and I'm not talking about it any more than that, because I've already humbled myself enough for the, this hour. Um, uh, the, um, but the vocals, the vocals line, you've lost that loving feeling there, but... Not the whole song, but Jesus, there an awful lot of it. Oh, no, not anywhere near the whole song. Yeah, I mean, every... That's one of the most Spectre's, elaborately yeah. uh, arranged songs and recorded songs ever made to this day. No, no, it's not, that's not it. It's, mm -hmm. it's what it is, is that's where the weight of the song is, that's where the intensity of the song is, and that's where the intensity of the other instruments came from. It came from the voices. I I'm not talking lyrics, I'm talking voices. Yeah, I immediately think of gospel music, of course, because I think that's... I was about to say so. Yeah. You know, not on your behalf. I didn't even do agree with you yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and that was part of it. You know, there was a show on TV in Detroit in... in uh, I don't know, I, it's, as far as I know, it was always, always there when I got there. But, and we would watch it, even in Cream Magazine, we would watch it called Motor City Golden Gospel. It was coming out of a church. I'm, I'm not going to guarantee that it was read the Franklin's Father's Church, but it could have been. Mm -hmm. And a lot of similar things did come out of there. And I would say to this day, well, not to this day, but, but down through my generation of Detroit rock people, all of these kids had grown up in one way or another, affected by that kind of music. Maybe it's what their family lived mm -hmm. uh, lived for. Maybe it's what they lived for from what they heard at their church. Maybe it was what they heard on the radio. But one way or another, that was not just in there, it was there. And it was beautiful. I mean, beautiful. It's, people talk a lot about it being powerful, which it was. But, you know, those harmonies, you, 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 you know, that's, and the words, come think of it. Mm -hmm. The whole thing, I mean, I know you a lot, know a lot about this, but it never hurts to repeat the necessary. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and so that was, you know, but that was just part of a mix. It wasn't. You know, and I don't know what they intended it to do, but if they intended to recruit a lot of people into any version of Christianity, I would say basically they failed. But what they didn't fail to do was to show people how much heart there could be in music, how much belief, how much energy, how much, you know, validation of certain things. And again, so you're back to that white black thing. Although I should also point out this, my dad, proud racist that he was, you know what he did on Sunday morning? Mm. He got up early and he listened to uh, the, the Stanley Brothers. Yeah. I mean, my dad got up at six o'clock in the morning. That's when he had to go to work. Actually, he probably got up at five because the train left at six. Yeah, he he was working on the train. So yeah, he was probably up at five, four thirty even. But what he would listen to, if he could find it, was he would listen to this white music that was the analog of gospel music in black hands. And my dad wasn't particularly re religious as far as I know. 
He didn't go. I do know that he didn't go to church. So I take it from there. Mm -hmm. But you know that music was very very important to me, and that became an important truth. It's the one thing I got from my dad about music that stuck. Because when I met John Landau and I met other people who knew about that music, one of the things they knew about was the Stanley Brothers. And I knew the Stanley Brothers. And I still think they were, for me, they, they're still the best of all those groups. I was listening to them the other day, very happily. You're constantly kind of open for and searching for the kind of passion you're describing. I had to do something with all the energy and intellect that I was supposed to be using in school that they wouldn't let me. But even as even as once, I'm serious, they wouldn't let you. Right. But even as you as a grown up, as an adult, when we're supposed to get fixed on whatever it is we like, you it seems to me keep moving on. I say well, this who told you that. Well nobody ever told me that I was supposed to stop. Right. I keep trying to alphabetize it, but it's it resists my alphabetization. Swamp dog. <laughs> <laughs> One of the great California R and B radicals. Well, see, that's John Sinclair's influence again, because John was a, a real voice, I think, in avant-garde, whatever people want to call it. But I was lucky enough late in his life to know Frank. smidgen of his perspective on all that stuff and you know he's that's another person people don't talk about enough anymore but you know when we were doing all this stuff about censoring uh, music fighting it um, Frank was Frank was a great teacher but on both that front and then when we got to know each other even a little bit then he would hold forth as you were doing something, going from one thing to another, or just to, to get on the phone late at night. And he, he, he always seemed pleased by that. And I came to really love him. But Frank fits with another part of this whole group of people I'm talking about, and almost all of them have this taint, which is that he was deeply committed to justice. And Frank was particularly articulate about things he didn't like. That was his, that was sort of the ground of his perversity. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, really when we were fighting to keep hip hop from being just, they wanted to do to hip hop what they do now to kids they don't like the way they wear clothes. In fact, they were clothes, they were, that was linked even then. And I don't believe the, the cops and other church people and stuff, I don't think they killed very many. But they'd have been willing. And he was one of the few guys who stood up with you. You understand that if they do that to them, they're going to do it to here. Because they don't like us any better, they just haven't got to us yet. And it's going on now. That's what all these murders of, uh, particularly of black teenagers and stuff... Yes, that's the same people. You saw that Barbara brought you some food. Do you want to eat a You want to take a break? Sure. 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 Yeah, I mean, I listen to Duke Ellington. I listen to a lot of things, but but if you say go put on a jazz record, I'm going to put on Miles, or I'm going to put on somebody post Miles, who's playing noise. Because that's what I enjoy listening to. The great experience I had last Christmas was, we were talking about Christmas records, I guess. I said, Wes, I don't know if you know this song, you should listen to it. Kind of a Christmas record. Mm -hmm. So I put on my favorite things. Written by uh, John Coltrane. And uh, so it was on there for a couple minutes, about six, eight minutes long. I said, well, you want me to take that off? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
went all the way through and he listened to it a couple more times before Christmas was over. Which means you think people are educated out of hearing it? You know what I mean? If you're young enough and you don't have the prejudices, you can hear it? I won't say hate always prevails, but it has a tendency to conquer. It's an attack on difference, and if you let people do that, you will scour the thing out, and it'll die. That's what they had in mind for rock and roll. Maybe. Definitely had it in mind for uh, for hip hop and heavy metal too, but more hip hop. The threat to hip hop, the threat that hip hop, you know, brought to light. I don't know. I never. I still don't understand. You don't understand what the threat was, you mean? I understand what the threat was supposed to be. There was no threat. No, I mean the actual rap music that they found very aggressive and very threatening. White Christians of whatever stripe they were, and I apologize to all the ones that weren't. Um, that's because they could see that they were once again losing control. And that's what it's always all been about. I was going to ask you about Welcome to the Terror Dome, Public Enemy, or Public Enemy in general. I wish there were more of it. I think the power of that group of people was that it was a group. That, which is not to say anything about how good any given musician is, because they're all fantastic. And there would be no hip-hop if they hadn't stepped in and taken it to that level. I don't think. You know, I think they're... they're I'd rather listen to them than the Rolling Stones, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> One's alive and one is dead. No, I don't think the Rolling Stones finished the job. I'm trying to think about what that means exactly. The Beatles finished their job and wisely stopped. If the Rolling Stones had stopped at some point along the way, it's very likely that they would have completed a job and that I would not be saying this. But I'm not the one who trivialized them. They are. It's frustrating as hell. And yes, they can still play. I mean, if Greg were here, Greg, Greg was saying that. <clears throat> no, they were just as good as they ever were, but they're not as a collective. Individually, as musicians, can they do what they did? Yeah, they can. I mean, I don't think Mick is much of a singer anymore, but he do. Charlie's driving the bus. The route is not important to him. <laughs> he likes driving buses. And that's mobile. And I really did like the hoop out of it. <laughs> there you go. I don't know anybody that doesn't think that's stupid, but Pete Townsend probably thinks it's stupid. Can I ask you about another song? Do I look like I'm here to prevent you? <laughs> oh, my name. It is With God on our side. My age, it means Who is the most important song, in a way, from that period? You can't ever say it's the most important song, because it's, it's not just one important Bob Dylan song, no matter how you slice it. But from that, of all his so-called protest songs, that's the one where he really stuck his neck out and said something nobody else had the guts to say. Not the only one, but it's it's 
he says it at its deepest, and he says it at its <clears throat> toughest, and he says it in a way that, if you know anything about American history, cannot be denied. He might be vulnerable on any of the other songs, but not that one. That's, that's got a page in my Bible. Mm. I'm always struck by how it begins, you know, my name, it means nothing. You know, it's the only song in which he boasts about being from the Midwest. I loved it when I heard it, and I love it more now, and he was just really good that day, <laughs> even for him. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that's just something that needed to be said. It needed to be said, in that case, very directly. And then it needed to stick around for, Jesus, what is it now? That must have been 63 or something. Yeah, so it'd be about 50 years or yeah, more. Almost 60, yeah. You know, he was placed in such a corner. I mean, he, as much as what he got through, was essentially red-baited out of, you know, all the, all the derision that all came from hating his leftism. Mm. Just about. The difference between the rock and roll haters and Bob Bob never said, shut up and do what I do. And they said both. And I'll take do what I do. Anybody can say that to anybody about anything. Be they right or wrong. Nobody gets to tell anybody else whether they're entitled to not do as they do. He certainly has a sense of injustice. The first thing you have to understand about that is that that's only half true. He has a sense of justice. No. Yes, he is interested, deeply interested in justice. He's never lost that and he's never betrayed it. <laughs> it's like, well, it's what you were saying about gospel. With gospel, you've made a conscious decision to find out what they think. And if you didn't want that, why did you tune in? Now, if you think that I, then I've got to believe that what you believe is true, I'll tell you what, I'll give you, a, whoever said that, I'll give you a turkey sandwich and a bottle of beer and we'll see which who it was that really created Bathsheba. <laughs> <laughs> What if we go from With God on Our Side to Merle Haggard? Continue. <laughs> Hungry Eyes never got called a protest song. On the other hand, in some ways it is. Well, it's not a protest song for two reasons that are kind of revealing, I think. One of them is that The protest really isn't manifest at the time that he writes the song. People are not trying to look at poor white people in agricultural America as oppressed. It's one of the great flaws in that movement period. And the, the other side of it is that you can't hear the Dylan song without getting caught up in, I won't say trapped, but caught up in the chasma and um, you know chaos of 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 the race issue. I, I think they're very different because one is a person speaking from a lack of power, and the other is somebody speaking from the point of, well, I want to say false power. 
you know, it's the strangest thing when you're raised by ra racists. If you grow up in that atmosphere, which I did, you know, completely segregated schools, completely segregated housing. Insane proportions of the churches stepping out to take participants as segregationists, as anti-Negro. If you've been in that situation, you know some things. And one of the things I know out of that is that they really do believe you'd be better off dead. They'll pray over it. Mm. Your own dad will pray over it sometime. And you could pretend there's nothing you can do about that, or you can do something about it. I don't see a third way. Mm -hmm. Well, you could move. But I don't know where you move on this planet. I was going to say, you can run, but you can't hide. Plenty of people pass, and you can hide. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's like my thing about this illusion that there are white people. And I don't know why nobody talks about it like that, because it's so obvious this is not white. You know, this is white. So how do you get from there to here? Mm -hmm. That ain't white. There's your white. There's your... What? There is your human. That's all that color is. Whether it's on the bottom of your hand or on the top of your hand. But there is no discussion in the United States of that set of issues. And do you think the, the music you've loved has done that some? No, nah, it's too busy getting laid. Uh, <laughs> I don't think the music ever does anything. I think it is there as a vehicle for people to do things with. But it's energy is always human energy. Always. There are some exceptions in it in a sense of like what we were talking about about jazz. But even then, those don't have that kind of ideological meaning. They're not capable of it. Now, there are people who have made ideological, have built ideology around those things. They did it with punk. They did it with jazz. They're doing it with something else right now, I guarantee you. That's all bogus. It's part of how you could know something's bogus. I just don't think it's there. I don't think there's anything that's pure or righteous. I don't think that. I think that's just not only a fiction, which is okay, but a stupid fiction, which is pity, pitiful. So clarify it a little for me, because I think a lot of your writing people think, well, it, he's saying this music is political. I'm saying that what's political is different than what they understand it to be. Mm hmm and I think that certain things, topics, not musics, but topics, mm -hmm. can be used to express, obviously that's what they're there for. They're verbal. And they're used to express points of view that are political. And does it connect to your, your point that we talked about before, that the music is not the lyrics? I think the lyrics are about what you decide the lyrics are about. I bet you anything, I could sit here with a pencil or even a ukulele and turn We Shall Overcome into a racist song. When people dis decide to believe that flat is round, when okay, flat can be round. That isn't even a complete contradiction. And if you decide that up is down, well, you just change the street sign. But then there's real meaning where 
large groups of people, or even smaller groups of people, have decided that something means something, have tried to articulate it, and are praised or beaten up for it. That's what I, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. That sound about right? Mm -hmm. Sound completely in, con in contradiction of what I've said elsewhere? I hope so. Contradiction keeps us going here. So I mentioned in the middle of that, interrupting you about everyday people. Yeah. Sometimes I'm right, but I can't it's not an anthem at all, but it's, it's a, wanna be. No, it doesn't want to be. But it's a song, it seems to me, that takes in a lot of these contradictions and makes something great from it. What they are in contradiction to is not the rest of the song. It is the way that the world interprets the words. It's not what the words mean. It's the way the world interprets the meaning. I mean, I don't mean it's like this is the only way it can be or this is the only thing it can mean. I'm telling you, it means this to me, and, I, and I'm implicitly saying, and a lot of other people too. I want to ask you a few more songs quickly, because this has been great. But just the short ones in there. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell when I ask you if it's a short one or not. But let me give you some quickly. Uh, then he kissed me, the crystals. Well, all those songs, Be Sure the Boy I Love, there's, there's like a little knot of them, right? Mm -hmm. People don't think of them that way, but they were people saying things that they were forbidden to say. But nobody said those things for a reason or a set of reasons. Men weren't to make themselves vulnerable to women. It's because we were to see ourselves as atomized rather than as part of a th multi-plural thing. It's all those things. I guess what I just told you is why all those songs are political in a way. Love songs are about love, and love is a complicated thing. And who you love is more complicated than that. And how you do, how you love them is none of your fucking business. A lot of the pop love songs were exclusionary in the sense that they were only represented a bipolarity. They didn't recognize any other kind of polarity. That's about freedom too. It's about the freedom to love who you love. I got a request from Sue Martinez, our friend, to hear you talk about Across the Border by Bruce Springsteen. Let me try this one. Because I think this is, in fact, this is almost identical song, but... Madam Morris Banks. Every year, Hundreds of people die trying to get into the United States. They die in the mountains, they die in the rivers, in the deserts, and they die in the backs of the vans. That's cool from Woody. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a song for them. This is called Nightmore's Banks. Hello, my darling, for you, kiss. For your sweet love.
all the people out there cheering for the song <laughs> realize that they just were cheering for a song that supports any goddamn Mexican who wants to come to this country to come. Because we stole it. Because we stole it from them. And we continue to steal it every day. I know that part of New Jersey where we were that night, and it may prevent me from ever going back there. I don't care. A great many of those people don't give a shit about that. I guess they do deserve to call themselves Bruce Springsteen fans. But it won't bother me at all if each and every one of them dies in hypocrisy. Because they're killing people by not helping. They're killing people by letting it go on. And it doesn't just go on in their country. It goes on in our country. That lie about... What do they call them? Migrants. Migrants are people. And the fact that Mexico is supposed to be a different country than the United States, that is about as much validity as the Confederacy does. In fact, less. I can tell you a story. When, uh, on whatever tour that was, that Bruce sang that song in and then a more Spanish song on that the uh, in New Jersey. That night we we were waiting for the show to begin backstage and I looked up and there was Chris Christopherson, who I hadn't seen in many a month because he's been very, very sick. And um, I said, hey, Chris, what are you doing here? He said, I, I heard that Bruce was going to sing Madame Morris Banks tonight. He said, that's my hometown. And I just looked at him, you know, because I didn't know that. I knew he was from South Texas, but I didn't know where he was from. And I knew his family were military, but I didn't know enough about it to put it, all the pieces together felt like apologizing to Chris that I didn't know that because everybody should know that. Not about Chris, but about all those kids now. And all those grown-ups now. We don't care to know. I don't particularly like knowing. But I do know, and once I do know, and I am in a position where I have to try to figure out something that I can help do about it. And when you make that decision, that song becomes a million times sadder and a thousand times more important. And if you can live with half of that and not the other half, I don't admire you, I pity you. What we have done to the people of a country that we flat out stole from them and punished them for going on 200 years for punished them. All you righteous people, you better hope there isn't justice. Because if there's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, you're going to be awful hungry and blind. <coughs> I don't know, you know, I, I do this thing where I cry freely. It's not showing off and it's not grandstanding and it's not 
thinking that the tears can fix them any better than the, mm-hmm. than, the, than, the than the prayers can. It's that I love children. And really, I like the ability to love adults too. And I've been very, very fortunate as long as I'm speaking more or less for the camera. Zoom! (laughs) (laughs) Went the springs of my heart. I don't know how many years ago it was that my daughter Kristen laid in the hospital bed. with clean sheets, surrounded by great nurses and doctors and a family who loved her, died of the cancer. And other people will cry their brains out along with me and my wife and her sister, Sasha. My oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And then Morris Banks doesn't mean what to us what the song that Bruce wrote that refers more obliquely to my daughter. If he doesn't if people don't understand that that's the same thing the exact same thing, except that one is the result of something that's incurable so far, and the other is the result of Americans being inhuman in their dealing with Mexicans. And until those are equal, I'll pass on being an American because it's a disgrace. (laughs) I don't know any better way to say it. We have an obligation to protect all of humanity or else rely on about the part that we think we are protecting. You're not protecting anybody unless you protect everybody. And until we do that, don't tell me about your patriotism, huh? When I was just working with kids at Santa Claus State, Mm -hmm or working with sick kids in general, because I did a lot of that, or some of, a little of that. That was one thing, and it was one thing. And I could take off the costume and go home, period. I can't do that anymore. Because God or whatever other forces there are out there translated it for me. And this is what it means. If it's her, it's me. And if it's not her, then it's not me. And I don't think Kristen would feel any way different. In fact, I know she will. All I know is that when the chance comes up, you speak up because that's what you do. You can sit there and wonder what Elvis would have done, or you could, or you could <laughs> stand there and do what Elvis should have done, or you can come to the conclusion that Elvis was smart enough to know that if he'd been a Mexican, they'd have done the same thing to him. And that's the truth. Now I'm done.
Thank you for joining us, everyone. And don't forget, this panel has been free, but we do ask that you consider making a donation to the Kristen Ann Carr Fa Fund, which Dave Marsh and Barbara Carr started in honor of their late daughter nearly 30 years ago. As I mentioned earlier, the foundation raises money for Sarcoma Research and Fellows, and you can find a link to it on the Land of Hope and Dreams website. So once again, thank you to everyone on the steering committee for the conference. Thank you to Daniel Wolf and, of course, to Dave Marsh for being such a great friend of the museum over the years. And it was great to be able to take part in this event celebrating your life and career. Thank you, Dave. And thank you to everyone. We hope to see you at a Rock Hall event soon in the future. <laughs>